from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow. This is the 287th episode of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. My name is Rob Snow White. This episode is brought to you by Solo Stove A and features Mark Hopley from the Fly Fishing 97 Podcast. Mark recently had me on his show as a guest, and now it's his turn to be interviewed on my show. As the borders are currently closed, we had to do the podcast over the internet via Skype. We'll cover everything from chronomids to the meat sweats. We start off with Mark's podcast, then dive into fly fishing his local Canadian waters and his still water methods to catch the trout near where he lives. This winter, how do you plan to spend your long cold winter nights entertaining your friends and family? But we have plans to be around our solo stove bonfire pit a whole lot. If you look at the evolution of man chart from the missing link to an upright human, you can guarantee that every human used a basic fire pit from the knuckle dragging version until the illustration shows the modern human of 2010 when the fire pit was redesigned by Solo Stove. We upgraded from our caveman era fire pit, and so will you. Get them while supplies last, as they're selling out fast with everyone else upgrading. Visit my website or links in my social media for a direct link. Every purchase you make through my link helps support my small business. Thank you very much. Mr. Mark Hopley, where are you right now? I am sitting in my fly tying room on a cool day in the Okanagan Valley, British Columbia. So I'm, I'm actually situated in uh, Penticton, British Columbia. So we're just just north of the uh, U.S. border in, in B.C., Canada. Okay. How far drive would it then be to the U.S. border? Literally would take me 45 minutes. If oh, I obey, close. yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. it's not far. And okay. I mean, most, most of Canada is right along the U S border, right? Yes. For the most. That's what I hear. <laughs> uh, do you have a celebrity doppelganger for those that may have not seen a picture of you before? Something they can picture <laughs> in their mind while we're speaking. Wow. You got me on that. Not really. When I had hair, and you'll probably lose some listeners if I say it out loud, but Chad Kroger when I had hair, but now I got no hair, so it's just me. I, I got is nothing. That because he is as well a uh, Canadian? Yeah, he's from the same province. Well, oh. uh, yeah. Yeah, he lives in lower mainland, but uh, like Vancouver area. I, I really don't have a doppelganger anymore. I would have said 10 years ago I did. It's starting to turn gray and fall out, so two two that. two kids will do that, and... Uh, Lots of work, right? Now, are your kids in school right now? No, they're nineteen, so they're they're oh, actual you're... they're dancers. So they're they're in New York uh, City taking taking a dance uh, at a dance school, but now they're back here with COVID and all that, and they're they're actually what, teaching. What kind of dance? Oh, uh, they do they do ballet, they do they do hip hop, they do jazz, they do uh, lyrical, you name it, just about Pretty anything. Cool. My neighbor's yeah. a professional ballerina, or wow. retired now teaches. Yeah, that's she's a tall level. one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You get uh, into trust me as a dance dad. I watched a lot of that over the years, and you've got to be you got to be pretty dedicated. Did the amount of fishing increase once the kids left the nest? <laughs> you know what it did, but now they're back, so it's like we're but I'm in a holding pattern. You're asking me at the wrong time of the year because I'm I'm a winemaker up here and and we're we're right in the middle of harvest so so right now is not my i kind of lost my fall fishing we'll get it back one day what varieties are you growing oh man uh <laughs> we grow a lot of bordeaux varietals up here so we have a lot of uh, merlot cabernet sauvignon cabernet franc petit verdot malbec uh and the whites we've got uh some burgundy and like some chardonnays we've got uh we've even got uh, pinot gris gewurz we do it pretty much you can name a grape you can pretty much grow it in the okanagan valley actually just due to the climate and we'll get into the climate later 
Yeah, we've got a real microclimate here. So it is it's quite arid and it gets really warm. So we have a lot of growing degree days. So I've been a uh, winemaker at Hester Creek uh, Winery for uh, seven years now. So we're on the Golden Mile bench. So we're just, just like I said, just north of the U.S. border. So you know how central Washington gets really dry and sagebrush and we get that heat. So we're, we're no different here. It's just... Um, so you get the rain shadow effect? Definitely get the rain shadow effect. And we also have a, a large, large bodies of water at the bottom of the valley. So we've got the Okanagan Lake, which is, you know, a hundred mile long lake. And then we've got Skaha and Vassa and Suyas Lake, which goes right through the border. And we got these beautiful benches that kind of rest clay bluffs that sit above the, the valley bottom. So we don't get a lot of frost in the growing season. So it, it's really well suited to growing, uh, growing good uh, wine grapes. Are your feet permanently stained purple? <laughs> You kill me. No, no, we have equipment for that now. <laughs> You're not doing it like I Love Lucy? Well, that's that's old school. Apparently, that's coming back. That's a little bit retro. True foot stomping. But no, we, uh, we so have... You have to be uh, a big barrel if you have to be six feet apart. <laughs> that's right. Everything's six feet apart now. That's right. It's a good thing alcohol is a very um, clean solution. Yeah, I need to go load up. We've got Halloween coming up this weekend, so I need... I need to load oh, yeah. up on beers and stuff for the adults walking by. What's going to happen with Halloween? Have you, have you put up one of these PVC shoots to the street, or what's going on there? So I have 500 brown paper lunch bags. I bought them for taking to fly fishing shows where I just tape the bag open under my vice, and then I can just knock all the junk in there. So we're just going to fill those with a handful each of candy from Costco. We've already eaten half the bag. Nobody in the house will admit that they're eating the candy. It's just gone. There are no peanut M and M's in there. There are no Reese's peanut butter cups. What's your favorite? Do, are you an M and M? I don't. I'm kind of go for the Milky Way. Not a big fan of M and M's. I prefer okay. the Smarties by Cadbury. If we're gonna yep. go that shellac candy. Mm, I like those peanut M and M's. I'm all over that. Yeah, and we used to get them from Costco, and we'd keep them in the refrigerator, so they were always kind of cold and not melty. <laughs> we were serious about yeah. peanut M's back then. Thank goodness Ch our kid is not allergic. I'm curious to see how it's going to go this year. I don't think we'll get a lot of kids, but you never know. You usually get the, the, the neighborhood faithful. It'll be interesting. Yeah, we normally do fire pits on driveways, so we'll have the solo stove going. And my wife's going to take the kid around while I'm at home with the cooler and the paper bags. And once it gets dark, they put in really bright LEDs in our streets. You it used to be pitch black out here, uh, which is you bad because the bear was spotted across the street yesterday. Oh, well, yeah, that yes. time of year, they're coming down. Not here. There, hmm. This is a, a rare thing to have this bear or bears in our neighborhood this year. Well, I mean, how far how far are you from from downtown DC? Are you you got to be away? Miles, maybe. Really? Can you, yeah, can you let's, let's do crow's nest to the Washington Monument. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, Washington Monument. Which I still have never been up in. Thirteen miles to the Washington Monument as the crow flies. Every time I talk to you, I'm blown away by the wildlife you get so close to an urban center. Yeah, we were out on a lake the other night, which is owned by Virginia, and it's a 24-hour boat ramp. And we were out there with the stealth craft, with the lights lit up, and all you could hear were owls, which Ooh. was really strange. Just owls all over the edges of the lake. That's cool. Yeah. Well, you get a lot of bald eagles down there, too. Uh, they're, they're, so we lose count. We have more ospreys in the D.C. metro area than anywhere else in the world, which is like spring and summertime. And the bald mm. eagles, I mean, if my clients want to see a bald eagle, I can take them by a certain tree and flush one out. They're that common. <laughs> and apparently see, the nests are full of cat and dog collars. Ooh. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's a little odd, yeah. But I can see that. We actually, uh, a neighbor, or not a neighbor, but somebody that I, I know fairly well, had their their uh, small dog picked up by an owl one time and then kind of dropped a few uh, few hundred feet down the road. But, yeah, you got to be careful with pets and, and birds of prey. We had a cat collar end up in our backyard one day, and, or a cat tag, and I asked my daughter, I was like, did you find this? And we called the number, and the guy's like, oh, our cat lost that like two weeks ago about three miles from here so i don't know wow. if crow picked it up or 
Mm. Yeah, apparently he had the cat, so I guess it didn't get eaten with the tag on it. Maybe it flew off with the collar after it fell off the cat. I don't know. That happens with coyotes around here, too. Yeah. And Go then on. they just stocked the creeks near us with trout. So we got trout locally now. Okay. That's yeah. good. That's good Hook news. And cook. You got to get out there before the poachers find them. <laughs> Have you been out much lately? Yeah, we've been having sort of a dry streak with just big fish and catching fish in general. Like the lake the other night, you could see we spooked what had to have been about a five foot long muskie in about two feet of water. I mean, it, it was enormous. You would have thought an alligator had just splashed in there. And we mm-hmm. spooked a couple of snakeheads. We saw a snakehead get eaten by a blue heron right in front of us. And we're throwing just weedless flies up in these grasses and just shaking them, making vibrations and nothing. <laughs> and then another well, weird thing we saw on Saturday, Saturday morning or Sunday morning, was a mm-hmm. cormorant hitching a ride on someone's gunnel on their boat. Just that's all cool. day it was out on this boat, just joyriding. Mm-hmm. Apparently it had been on a woman's kayak the night before. Sounds like uh, a bird that's pretty used to uh, being around people. Yeah. <laughs> We, got I say, we have looms that pass through. You don't hear them, but you'll see them. Hmm. Very nice. And I also saw a couple in a boat made out of storage bins the other day down by National Airport. The uh, the locals around here that are, are not local local, they're not from here. They call it Reagan National. If you're right. from here, it's just national. They changed okay. it 20 years ago. But yeah, these, yep. this couple went out yep. onto the river in a homemade boat with boards and storage bins. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've only been to, the only place I've been in D.C. is is, is a couple of airports, to be honest, to, on my way somewhere else. But uh, one day, it's on my list. Yeah, you can walk right out of National Airport and within five minutes be on Striper, Snakehead, Gar, Carp, or whatever's moving through that pocket of water at that time. And hmm. then you can go back. Don't even need waiters. You can fish from shore. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. And the out-of-state license for D.C., you may be on Virginia shoreline, D.C. jurisdiction. I think it's $13 a year. If if only I could find a guide in the metro D.C. area. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to work on that. So speaking of fishing, how did you get into this to end up having your own podcast? Well, it's it's a funny story. It's, so basically, I... I have a radio background, so I was in radio for a lot of years, and I actually had a fishing show 30 years ago. And it was another career ago, and and I I used to work in a fly shop, and I've just I've always had a passion for fly fishing. And when podcasts started kind of getting a little more mainstream, I got to admit I I didn't listen to a lot of podcasts early on. I've probably really only been listening to podcasts for maybe six seven years, and then I just one day I said to my wife, I said, why, why don't we do a podcast? She, she was in radio for years too. And I thought, well, it's kind of a natural fit. I mean, it's the editing. I love the, I love doing editing. It's basically a conversation with people. You find something you're passionate about. Like for me, I don't know if you can hear this. The dog just walked. Brady, come here. I got a dog that <clears throat> he's having a bit of a stomach issue. Can you hear him hacking? Does, <laughs> does he have a radio he, voice too? He's got a, I, I don't know. He talks a lot. I wouldn't call it a radio voice. He's got an annoying bark voice. Did he so get into something? Time. So last Saturday, I no, it was Saturday out of my clients because I came back, made smoke queso on the Traeger. We're mm-hmm. eating smoke queso on the back porch. All the doors are open. And I'm looking straight through the French back doors into the front door. And I see two ears and a nose sticking up at the front <laughs> door. I was like, oh, okay. There's a, there's a dog here. It turns out my neighbor, Olga, and I found out today why her dog had this horrendous stench. It jumped out of their yard and rolled in a dead raccoon and then came to our doorstep. We didn't have a leash, so we used a waiter belt clipped through its collar, and I'm going to probably burn the waiter belt. <laughs> I, I had a border collie that used to love rolling in horse manure. <laughs> That's not a, the worst of poops, though. No, it could be worse. It could be cow. But yeah, feline anyway. poo, predatory poos are nastier. <laughs> but sorry, I got I got off topic there with the dog. I have a bit. whole photo album of poos of Africa from when I went there. Well, that's the difference good, between hy- like hyena poo looks like chalk because they eat bone, whereas an Ooh. elephant eats grass. 
Right. I was a biology Basically. major, and I did funny slideshows of dead things and poop. I digress. Well, you know, it's it's an important skill, especially when you're out in the bush. It, it long answer to your question. Uh, radio background, passion for fly fishing. I just thought, what the heck? One day, uh, a couple two and a half years ago, let's do this, and I've been doing it ever since. And I I, I just love. I love getting people's stories, Rob, as you know, it's like, for me, it's like, it's not work when you just sit down, you call up somebody and just chat fly fishing or, you know, fishing in general. For me, it, it's a release and it, I love talking about it. I love doing it. I love, I love everything about fly fishing. It's just that escape from the everyday. I love the fly tying all winter long. It's just, it's just kind of part of my DNA at this point. Now that original show you did, was that ever advertised in Fly Fishman Magazine around 94, and it was no. an AM station? No, it was an FM station. It was a country station, and it was called Spin and Fly, and it was, uh, I can't even remember. I think it was sponsored. That was a long time ago. I, I What I used to do is I just basically would phone fishing resorts, and and I'd check in to see what kind of where the bite was, and then I'd have, you know, we'd have a biologist on, or we'd have a... Um, a fisheries biologist and just chat about you know stocking programs and 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 fishing in general but that was that was a long time ago now part of just a, modernized a, it yeah well the thing i like about the podcast and i i know you probably can relate to this more than anybody it's so specific right you can you could find out you can talk anything like in you know the dog's really Sorry, he's ramping up his game here. It's a Did good thing this isn't eat video. Something nasty? Do you smoke too much? What's it, the hacking for? I have a dog that's allergic to protein. Imagine that. That's no good. No. It's no, like a fishing guide that doesn't eat fish. That's right. Yeah, that's not far off me. I don't eat a lot of fish. I, I do like salmon, but I, I got to admit, I let all the trout go. If my job was chasing chickens down, we'd be feasting all the time. <laughs> I've tried catching chickens, though. It's not easy. They were in the parking lot once by National Airport, which was the odd thing. And my buddy, Scott Sankus, and I were going snakehead fishing with my canoe. And I pull in, and there's dead chickens in the lot. I'm like, all right, I've found Santeria sacrifices before. This is a little out of place. And then there's five or six more solid black chickens with a red circle right behind where their ear would be, like the hang-up button on Skype, that color red in that circle. Could not hmm. catch one for the life of me. Well, I, I I hear chicken catchers get I actually no one. They get paid quite well, so it can't be that easy. Yeah. There was a bit in Rocky about that, I believe. Chasing a chicken. <laughs> I, uh, I just had for some reason was thinking of Jerry, little Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, little G little Jerry. <laughs> little, little, little Jerry, Jerry. Seinfeld. <laughs> Remember that? I forgot oh. about that. Cockfight. Jerry. Yeah, that was the bad guy from Clear and Present Danger who had little Yeti. <laughs> All right, so how did you get into fishing? If the radio came after you knew a bit about fishing, where'd the where'd the itch and the bug come from? And growing up um, where you were in Canada, was there a fly fishing culture? Was there a fly shop? Where'd you yeah, well, get your information yeah. from? So it's funny. So my folks moved from, from Britain. So we moved out here from uh, Birmingham in... 73 72 and then yep. so on, um, they there. moved what up year? uh 1972 so uh, they, w they moved up okay. to uh like north northern bc hold on and uh you know a, a long cold winter they decided you gotta start oh. that over again i heard 72 oh. and then long cold winter it must have been cold <laughs> if there's that gap it sounds like an album 1972 my, my folks moved out here from britain from from the uk from Birmingham, like the Midlands, they spent a winter in Fort McMurray, which is, um, you know, pretty far north and pretty cool. So they, um, I think after a winter there, they kind of said, well, let's, let's go back. So they went back to Britain. And so I started school in England and then, uh, ultimately moved back to the Okanagan in, uh, in the mid seventies. In answer to your question, my, my family wasn't much into fishing. Um, I'd see, you know, a lot of carp fishing and whatnot in, in Britain when I was little, I can recollect some of that. I kind of got the interest. And then when we, uh, my dad was a teacher, the principal of his school, his name was Bob Dunn, and he was a really passionate guy about fishing. And he actually, um, he took my dad, my brother, and, and uh, himself, we were uh, fishing on a, an area lake. I want to say it was probably 
probably uh, seven, eight, maybe, maybe nine years old. I can't remember now, but that's kind of when it started for me. We went to it. We just lights out on a on a small alpine lake, brook trout, rainbows all day long, and I thought this is that was the most fun I can remember having. Just kind of been chasing that ever since. How much fishing did you do as you got older? Does your wife into fishing too? Uh, was she cool with uh, you taking off? No. No, she's so no. My wife isn't. I mean, she's cool with me going. She's um, she's not really into it. I, we've tried a few times. Got her out in the old pontoon boat and uh, even the belly boats back in the day, or or the river. Um, but it's not really her thing. She encourages me to go, so that you know, I'm grateful for that. I think just having that. If you're passionate about anything, your partner, you got to back it up, right? So whatever that is, it just makes life better. You need that. And so for me, that's, it's just a, it's a release, right? So when you get super busy and you get a day off, you get out on the river or on the lake and there's just, um, you know, you just, it just kind of de-stresses, you kind of gets you back to nature and, and not thinking about, you know, day-to-day, day-to-day work. And I, I just, it's a great release. And I, I just think that it's, for me, it's a form of therapy. And I know that sounds a little cheesy, but I talk to a lot of people that find that in tying that find that in 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 fly fishing in general it's just it's a great escape and uh you know the outdoors in general doesn't matter what you're doing if you're out in nature you're probably in a good place yeah i've got the afternoon off tomorrow and i want to go fishing but we're getting another tropical depression with several inches of rain so i don't think i'm gonna have time to go out Mm. and do my own water therapy tomorrow yeah, it's uh, and then that's the thing, right? You're at the mercy of Mother Nature. I don't know about you yeah. though, but some of the, when it rains, sometimes that's the best fishing. If if the water's up, whether you're salmon fishing or um, the fish, they get a little less spooky for sure. We have the urban runoff here, so everything just get. I mean, there's so much asphalt and rooftops that everything just gets blown out here. It's I think mm. the Potomac's supposed to go up about three feet by Friday. Well. So you've That's got two of kids. Yeah, dude, there's a lot yep. of water coming. Two kids. So you got two, two kids. Did you get them into fishing? And if so, were they into it or reluctant? <laughs> I'd say reluctant, largely. But yeah, we got them out when they were young, you know, worm and bobber. Not not so much fly fishing because that, that is challenging when they're little, I think. And let's face it, when you're when you're young, I think the younger you are, you just need to get into fish. So we, we'd go out for perch and, and uh uh, you know, uh, crappie, what else would we chase? You know, trout and whatnot. But just, just basically, you, you're trying to keep, when you're with kids, you want to keep them entertained and keep them busy because their attention spans are short. But not really their thing, but maybe it'll come full circle. And they like being outdoors and, and whatnot. But uh, no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm the only fly fisher, I would say, in the house, to be to be quite honest, Rob. Very nice. All right, I want to get into some more Canadian stuff with fishing. But sure. first, I want to go back to the podcast a bit. Have you had any drawbacks of hosting your own podcast not really i mean i haven't seen a lot of downside i think <clears throat> as the show grows and i think you and i talked about this at one point it's like you're gonna you're gonna run into people that don't like what you're doing and they'll let you know and it's like well hey you don't have to listen to it if you don't want to you know it's it's optional <laughs> I, I got lit up a couple times on social media which you know i'm, I'm a bit of a softy i'm just like oh okay uh, i I try not to take that stuff personal, whatever. It, so I struggle a little bit with the social media just because you feel like you're always, you're throwing yourself out there. You really are, right? So, but at the end of the day, I think I haven't had, I don't have a lot of negative, negative things to say. It's been, it's been largely positive. I, I'll get, I mean, you know how it is. You get an email from a listener says, hey, I love what you're doing. What do you think about ha- trying to talk to this person? I, I'd really like to hear what they have to say. And that I, I love that because that's that's more interactive for me. You know, I, I can't say anything negative about it, really. It's just that's the only thing I do struggle with a little bit is the social media aspect of it. Have you had any technical difficulties in recording, editing, saving something? I mean, I've had so many episodes not record. One of them had yeah. happened twice. And the guy, I'm kind of been ghosted. Yeah, well, that's I, I get that. That's one of my biggest fears is that you basically do this amazing two-hour-long interview, and then you don't save it, or you, you know what I mean? It's like you can't get that back. But 
I've been lucky with that. And and I'll tell you something. I basically delete everything after I record it because I find, like, because you do long format also, and it's like these conversations eat up a lot of a lot of megabytes, right? They, they take up a lot of space on your laptop. Or, Indeed. And I, so for me, it's, I just try to keep it current. I try to every year do a best of show. So I try to hold on to episodes for at least 12 months so I can go back and, and kind of pull clips out of them. But, you can always I mean, just what, re-download them off of iTunes. Exactly, and that's and and you know what's funny you said that I, I've just recently kind of come to that realization is I don't need to store them because they're they're out there, right? So I guess the the one downside I would say is you know you may say something you regret or someone might say something they wish they didn't say and then you put it out there it's out there. So unless I and I do edit pretty hard. So if, if I think somebody says something that's really offensive to anybody, I try to take that out. And I know that's that's not always the norm on some podcasts, but I just um, something I struggle with too is is the swearing. Like I, I when I started, I I edited every swear word because I thought you know what there's kids listening, and I know some people get offended by it. But it's, it's gotten to the point, where, <clears throat> what I find is, like with iTunes, if you have one swear word in your show, all of a sudden, all your shows are X-rated, right? Or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Explicit. You also lose listeners globally, because there's certain countries around the world that if it's explicit, you won't get any downloads. Like So <laughs> since I started doing that, I've noticed way more North American downloads, but a lot less from globally. I don't know if those two things are correlated, but it's just... Food for thought. It's something I, I notice. Do you have one country that listens more than others? No, I'm going to say the States. I mean, most of, I, well, I mean, let's face it, that's where the population is in North America. I, I do get a lot of Canadian downloads as well. Um, I get a lot from um, mostly California, Pennsylvania, Colorado is huge. But then I'll find there's little pockets all over the place that's just like, you know, it, it's actually kind of a real cool exercise for me when I look at the data and I go, where's this town? And something I started doing was, okay, top 10 cities for downloads this week. And it's almost never the same. You know, you'll, you'll, I'll hear of some town in South Dakota I'd never heard of before. And it's kind of cool to look it up and say, oh, there's 1,500 people live there. And somebody just downloaded 60 of your podcast. That's kind of cool. You gave a shout out to somebody in one episode from Reston, Virginia, which is where I'm from. <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't Whoever that me. is, kudos. Yeah, well, it's for me. That's that's pretty cool, you know. Like, and that's that's what I love about the internet, and that's what I love about the fly fishing community. It's we may be, you know, a, a 15, 20 hour drive or a four or five hour flight from each other, but really, it's not that far, and we're all kind of have the same interests, and we're all chasing fins and doing the same thing. And I get a lot of listener feedback from Australia. When the mailbag comes, it's mm. Australians. A lot of Australian listeners. Yeah, their podcasts are huge in Aussie for sure. I get a lot of New Zealand, Australia. I get quite a few UK and lately South Africa. But I think that's because I did have a South African guide on it. I think a lot of it depends on who you're chatting with and who they know. And You know what? I always think that like the the social media part of it, like the Facebook and the the uh, Instagram, is not always indicative of my downloads. The downloads are more usually word of mouth and from the guests that I have, if that makes sense. Yes. Do you have one guest? For me, it was Richard Franklin. The two of us just chilling in a hotel, him talking trout fishing stories. Most downloaded of all time. Yeah, that's cool. That is cool. I well, I, I liked your uh, your story about Lefty Cray too. I got a real kick out of that. That was a um, afternoon when the microphone turned I, off. That's when the the interesting stuff was told. <laughs> yeah. Well, you and I talked about that on on my show a few a few months back, and that and it was entertaining for sure. In answer to your question, I've I've had um, Lonnie Waller, um, Steelhead Guru. He was amazing. Basically. Um, near death experience should have died more than once got in a plane uh, crash on a, on a, on the Babine river in, uh, in Northern BC. And he told that story. Like, uh, I was just riveted listening to that. I've had Phil Rowley on. He, I mean, Phil is a Canadian legend in fly fishing. I mean, I've had, well, I've had some, 
I'm, I'm just really grateful that anybody wants to pick up the phone and chat. And when it's when it's a you know it's a big name, that's great. But I'm I'm not all about that. It's for me. Uh, everyone's got a good story. Um, everyone has a story, and you don't have to be famous to have a great story. And and so for me, it's like. I like finding those those people that nobody knows who they are. That's that's to be honest with you, that's kind of my goal. I, I don't, I'm not looking for big big names all the time. I'm looking for people that have interesting stories, and there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, that's the thing with Richard. He's just a a guy from Long Island that fishes. Worked at Orvis for years in New York City and does stuff with Project Healing Waters and knows everybody at the Somerset Edison show. It's amazing. He knows everybody. <laughs> Richard Franklin went to high school with my mom, but they didn't know each other. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a small world when you start chatting. You'll usually yeah. find some commonalities, right? It gets better. He lives catacorner to my first cousin in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. You can almost <laughs> see their houses from each other's porches. <laughs> yeah. Six degrees of separation. Yeah. Right? But, yeah, that's good stuff. So you were saying George Daniel? Yeah, we had George Daniel on. I, I love talking with him. I mean, I had um, a fly rod builder out of Seattle that's also a firefighter by day, and he talked about his passion for building bamboo rods, and I, I really found that interesting. We had uh, Pete Stitcher on recently from Ascent, and that guy, I could have talked to that guy all day. He had... He's just such such an easy guy to talk to, and he verbalized some things about entomology and fly fishing that I hadn't hadn't quite heard. Other, you know, I, I find it interesting when people find different ways to explain what we do, like whether it's the craziness of spending all this time to go the middle of nowhere, spend all this money just to catch a fish to let it go. <laughs> you know, it's like to outsiders, you're they're probably thinking like, w w what's that about? You're not even going to kill that fish. You're going to let it go. My job, and I have to explain to people, what do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, I teach people to catch fish that they throw back. People look <laughs> at me like, just, wait, did I hear you correctly? I'm like, oh, no, you heard it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, there's so many, so many good stories out there. And I've had uh, a lot of entomologists, a lot of um, former biologists that are turned, you know, fly fisher industry people. Landon Mayer, hey, Landon was awesome. I think I, that was the episode with the rest and listener shout out. Could could be. I don't. I do that. I try. I was doing that every every show, so I would have the top ten downloads. I got to get back to that because I actually got a lot of good feedback. People like to hear that. I think when, you know, if you're living in a small town in in Minnesota and you get a shout out, I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, the last shout out dedication was to a guy who sent me a nasty gram about a, wanting to preserve Alaska. And today, of I course. They're allowed to go and, and cut trees down in the Tongass. The salmon forest rule of uh, roadless has been negated. I listened to that to your, your latest show. I listened to that one this morning on the way to work, actually. Yeah, Matt's a great dude. You got to see him in person, though. He's got very distinctive eyes that look right at you when you're talking. Very interesting <laughs> to talk to him in person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that with a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the outdoors, they can kind of, you can see it in their face, right? Same with guides, there's a lot of guides. That, I mean, you spend that much time in the outdoors and the wind and the, you know, you see a few things and you, I always think you can kind of see that in people's eyes. It sounds cheesy, but I think it's true. You know who I had? I had We had a um, sporting diversity road tour on recently. So we had, uh, basically it was, a gentleman from Spoke Hollow Outfitters and uh, Davin Topol, who's a distiller out of Austin, Texas. And they basically took us on a road trip. And that was really cool because that's something you used to do a lot. And I, I really enjoyed your show when you're on the road and you're reporting in from these. Well, obviously, these shows aren't happening right now. But, uh, you know, you'd be talking about the people you ran into and the food you ate and the beer you had too much of. And I, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I love the uh, kind of natural kind of flow of your show. And it's, uh, it's actually influenced what I'm doing quite a bit. Thank you. I'm trying to get a steelhead trip lined up car camping. I just don't mm. know when or where it's going to be. Yeah. You know yeah, what? Because I don't have my, my wife can't watch my kid while she's at school. That's what I'm right. stuck here doing. So I, well, maybe Christmas vacation. <laughs> I don't know. You'll find, you'll find your windows, right? It's like anything. <clears throat> it, it ebbs and flows. 
like you take for granted sometimes when you're out there all the time and let's face it we all get times in our lives when we get busy with with day jobs and kids and family and stuff but i actually found that this this past little um you know this last 10 month stretch with everything that's been going on it's more important in my mind now than ever to get out get out in those open spaces like for a lot of reasons it's uh it's just good for the psyche and it's you know it's it's healthy because you're not you're not sitting on a subway or uh you know it's it's good stuff i really enjoy that i can drive to spots what normally would take an hour and 15 minutes now to get to a fishing location with clients at 5 p.m. takes me about 15 to 20 minutes. Wow. Because so that, many people, yeah. you can't, I mean, the whole, this whole area is built around working in offices for the government, either as an employee or a contractor. And no mm-hmm. one's going to work. So the roads are empty. It's amazing. Well, that's something that's happened up here, I noticed, is is house prices have gone up in a lot of places because people have realized that they can do their job from home. Like a lot of office jobs, if you've got a laptop and, you know, uh, you can scan documents, you can work pretty much anywhere. So you don't necessarily have to live in the city. And I think that's opening up a lot of a lot of places for people right now. However, loophole federal employees that live here get an extra stipend for cost of living. And Mm. if they leave the area to telecommute, they will no longer receive that pay. Interesting. Yes. So there's almost an incentive for people to be here. Right. Yes. So are you going to be glad when this election's over? Yeah. I want to not have to watch the news for a while and, (laughs) <laughs> just get back to a, a hopefully a normal sense of humanity and what is right and wrong with social yeah. mores and common sense. I watched your debate the other night. I had to shut it off. No offense. I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> it was almost like there was an, a per, Donald Trump impersonator playing Donald Trump with the hand gestures. I, I just, I had to look. I just, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, okay, is this, is this going to solve anything? <laughs> no. I thought Joe Biden was going to fall asleep standing up. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a very political guy at all. I just, I just find it interesting to see what people are saying. And there was an article about four weeks ago about people in Bangladesh that feel bad for Americans. Hmm. Well, I think you know what politicians are politicians. It doesn't matter where you live, but uh, yeah. I try not to go down that road too often. (laughs) That's actually yeah. You get that's one thing on the show when. When people get political, I just uh, and it, and that is hard because let's face it, a lot of these conservationalist uh, movements, or whether it's Pebble Mine or it's any of these big big topics, you can't help but get involved in politics. So, um, if we look at the resource first and try to put the politics aside, it would be ideal, but it's not that easy. Right. All right. Well, let's do some Canadian stuff now. Oh, tell me about Canadian Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, we just had it early October. It's usually like the just after the first weekend in October. It's actually probably my favorite holiday. I mean, is it like hours where you just eat a bunch of food and fall asleep and then wake up and eat leftovers? Hundred percent. It's all about it's all about the turkey. It's all about the harvest. It's all about the pumpkin pie. Yeah, it's just uh, just about being grateful for. Uh, for, for what you have and yeah no it's it's definitely my, my favorite one of my favorite holidays for sure it's uh although it's right smack in the middle of harvest for us so it's um that's a challenge sometimes but uh we usually make it happen so um and in fact i know a lot of winemakers that uh, celebrate american thanksgiving strictly because it 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 happens after the vintage so you know by the time you guys have yours what is it it's like november 26th somewhere in that range yep and, and yeah. th- last Thursday or something. Yeah. And you know what? I, I love it because I, I, I'm a big NFL guy. So I usually get to watch the Detroit Lions lose. <laughs> that's my neighbor Jimbo. That's his team. <laughs> no, I actually like Detroit, but they don't they don't seem to win a lot of games lately. But I, uh, I always do like watching football on Thanksgiving. And this is the first year my family's not getting together since, I want to say, 50, 1958, 56 in the D.C. area. Wow. And we would do them sometimes at my cousin's restaurant. He would shut down his main Italian restaurant and host us all as a big potluck there. He had to sell off all his restaurants. 
You had a big family. We have, yeah, with the cousins now and everyone's kids. It's, yeah. I think the last one had 70 people. And then wow. my cousin's wife, her family started showing up and we're like, well, this is just chaos now. So we're just <laughs> going to do a Friendsgiving with our quarantine here. I'm definitely doing the turkey. Yeah. Making mashed potatoes and I'm making a sweet potato gratin. You ever do the turducken? I've had a pie caken, but I've never had the turducken. What the heck is a pie cake? <laughs> My cousins brought it from Manhattan. It's a pie with a cake around it. Oh, okay. You know what I thought you were going to say? You take a pike, like a, like a musky. <laughs> That'd be more like you filter fish for Passover. <laughs> so maybe I should yeah, make a filter fish with a matzo ball around it. Okay. Give yeah. that a whirl. All right. What are some misconceptions Americans may have about Canadian fishing that it's not all just igloos uh, over frozen water i've got i've never seen an igloo but i've heard about them i think that's the biggest thing is everyone thinks that it's that far north it's cold all the time and uh, let me remind you we're a lot further south than alaska i mean do we get snow yeah we get snow but we get snow like like you know minnesota gets snow or we get snow like um the dakotas get snow or montana gets snow or, or washington state so it's i mean we we have warm summers it's 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 very much like parts of colorado it's actually warmer to be honest because we don't have the elevation where i'm at but uh you know you get into the rockies uh you know it's more that way but i would say that our open water season is probably longer than probably most people realize like especially where where i'm at it's it's probably you know i've been i've been fishing valentine's day open water well, i shouldn't admit that my wife might hear that but she, she already knows that April 1st is usually kind of April to, I would say, early November is kind of our open water season, depending on your elevation. So we have, you know, once you start getting up in elevation to some of the alpine lakes, obviously it's a lot shorter. I would say that's a misconception is, is that, and, it, and that it doesn't get hot here because it sure does where I'm at and, and across basically the whole country. But it's really arid in the, in the Okanagan Valley. You mentioned the rain shadow effect. We, we get that, but we also have mountains that get dumped on for snow. So there's lots of skiing, um, lots of ice fishing. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it, that's, that's actually one. Okay. So as much as everyone's like, okay, dams are, are, are bad. The thing about dams is they really control the flow. They control the runoff, or at least you have the ability to do it. So up here, um, there's not, I mean, there, don't get me wrong, there's dams, but in the systems that I'm fishing, there's not a lot of dams. So they get scoured pretty hard. So when that runoff goes, it really goes. And and when it settles down, it really settles down. So our, our windows windows on the rivers that I fish are really short, like, like for good fishing. I, I would say you've got like, basically in a normal runoff year mid-june to early august and then and then the water levels get so low and the water temperature heats up and and then it can slow right down so that's why primarily i'm in still water so i mean the kamloops region i always say kamloops region because the people know the kamloops region it's it's, it's world renowned for still waters i'm basically an hour and 20 minute drive from there but it's it's pretty good in our neck of the woods there's a lot less lakes but because it's so dry but you also have some very prolific lakes because you've got, you know, slightly warmer temperature, usually slightly higher pH waters, nitrogen rich water and uh, some trophy rainbow trout. There's definitely some some large fish in, in our area and, and the Kamloops area is uh, is well known for that. Are these all these still waters and we're going to get into still water fishing in a bit. That's sort of the, the third part of the podcast. Are these natural impoundments or do you just have natural forming lakes and ponds? Here in Virginia, there's two natural lakes. That's it. Mm, no, so no, everything they're I fish pretty much is man-made. Yeah. I mean, there's a combination of both, but I would say of what I'm fishing, probably 90, 90% of them are natural lakes. The, the challenge, Rob, is that some of the lakes would winter kill, right? So, uh, you know, you may be only dealing with a 20 foot deep lake. So if it gets super cold, you know, in any given winter, it may, you know, the fish may or may not make it. So a lot of times they've put aerators on some of these waters. If there's not an inlet or outlet stream, sometimes that can be challenging because, you know, you don't have a lot of flow 
And if the lake doesn't have the depth to overwinter fish, you can run into some issues. But we have a really, really good stocking program here. We have one lake in particular, and it's on Highway 97C. It's called uh, Penask Lake. And it, it is known for the Penask strain of rainbow trout. And so this lake has never been stocked, ever. It's at a high elevation. It's very prolific. The fish get they're voracious insect feeders. So they, they don't necessarily, I've never seen a panas chase a minnow. Uh, they don't eat other fish. They eat insects. So they, they really are well suited to fly fishing. So uh, whether you're fishing caddis or chronomids or, or uh, dragonfly nymphs or mayfly nymphs or uh, whatever you're fishing, any type of insect terrestrial or otherwise, they're, they're always willing to take it. And the coolest thing about these fish is they love to jump. You will never find it. It's like catching a, a steelhead or a, a, a clean silver coho. They're just, they'll be out of the water 10 times and you'll be like, what is going on here? So they're, they're an amazing fish and they stock them widely in our region. We also have blackwater rainbows, which are uh, um, basically um, came from the blackwater system in uh the uh, caribou chilcotin area of british columbia so those are more geared for um they eat their meat eaters so um they like to eat you know whether it's uh red-sided shiners or other other minnows so they've got a real diverse they've got fraser valleys which are um they get big in a hurry but they don't jump they just they just kind of they pull down hard and they they fight well but they, they it when you hook a fish here, a lot of times you can tell what you have by the way it's fighting. If it's jumping in the air, you probably know what it is. If it's pulling straight down and not not leaving the water, you probably know what it is. So they do a great a great job stocking the lakes here because most of them wouldn't hold fish, to be quite honest. I mean, a lot of them would, but a, a lot of them wouldn't because they just they wouldn't winter without help. And and say a, a lake winter kills they may go back in and stock it with fraser valleys because they will grow quickly or they you know that they there's a lot of research behind what they do pretty grateful for the program we have up here we're pretty lucky now when i think of canada with all the reading i've done throughout my life and in internet movies shows i think of quebec Atlantic salmon, flying lakes for huge walleye northerns and giant brook trout, Great Lakes tributaries, Bow River, <laughs> and is it Calgary or it's Calgary, right? Calgary. Well, <laughs> there's a debate on that, but I think I, right. I say Calgary. Okay. And then you've got West Coast steelhead and salmon and stuff. Have you had a chance in your life to, to visit what I would consider these great fisheries that I've always heard about? I have to talk wider. I got in trouble. Did you? Okay. Yeah, I so, got yelled at. <laughs> that's not the first time, though, is it? Oh, no, I'm always getting in trouble for shouting. But if I have a couple of drinks in me, I get really loud. And then have I'm you got like, a drink in front of you right now? No, I'm drinking uh, ice water. I got to take this one little, night off. I got some Cabernet going here. So, Market research or your own? Uh, Actually, it's, uh, it's our own. But I'm researching it. Nice. So, so where were we? Uh, I you got to realize. I mean, Canada, like like the states, is a huge landmass. I mean, I've never I've been to Montreal once. I've never spent any time fishing in Quebec. I so I'm a Western guy. So basically, British Columbia would be like living in say say Seattle or or say Portland. Uh, I mean, doesn't mean you necessarily know the waters of Maine, if that makes sense. So indeed. Uh, I, I fish, um, the, the, probably the f most famous waters that I fish would be the Thompson River. I mean, that used to have some of the biggest steelhead anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, their, their numbers are in decline. I don't think you can even fish it now. You can fish it for resident rainbows at certain times of the year, but we used to go over there and not, not that we had a lot of success because there wasn't uh, the numbers. I kind of I'm a little too young to to know those days when it was amazing, but just giant monsters out of that system, which which they come up the Fraser and then up the up the Thompson River, and and they still do. I actually got somebody coming on this week to talk about that run, but big big fish. Um, 
in answer to your question, I, I fish still waters. So I'm fishing, you know, really well-known still waters in the interior of BC. But the Bow River, I haven't fished. I fished, uh, I guess I fished the Elk River. That would probably be one of the most famous rivers I've spent time on. Love that river. It flows kind of through the kind of the foothills of the Rockies, um, just kind of through Fernie, British Columbia, and towards the Alberta border. And uh, you want to catch some beautiful, beautiful West Slope cutties. There's bull trout in there that'll just uh, shock the heck out of you. You (laughs) think you're into something huge, and you might be. That's a blue ribbon water for sure. You mentioned the bow. That's on my list. I haven't fished the bow, but there's so many rivers to it. And once you get up north into northern British Columbia, northern... Uh, you know, parts of the Rocky Mountain kind of trench. There's all kinds of systems that um, you'll find uh, West Slope cutthroat um, rainbows. We don't have a lot of brown trout where I'm at. There's some obviously in the Bow and there's some on uh, some Vancouver Island rivers, but we don't get a lot of brown trout up here. It's not a, there's no stocking program that I'm aware of. It's all about the rainbows and the brook trout. All right. Are there any Canadian urban legends Specifically with regards to fishing, Canadian people down here would not know about. Wow! When you say urban legends, you're talking specifically metropolis stuff, or are you just talking Anywhere. Canadian fishing legends? You always hear down here about the diver that went down to fix a dam, fix a pipe, find mm. a, a car, and they saw the catfish that was so big. They mm-hmm. came up to the surface and said they'll never go back down there again. I've heard a story like that every couple of years of my entire life. No one I've ever heard has actually seen the catfish in person. Yeah, well, That's I have idea. a similar story. I've talked to somebody that there's a big floating bridge and that separates uh, Kelowna from from kind of uh, the South Okanagan. There's a... a um, the floating bridge there. And I you talked to somebody that knew somebody that was a diver when they built the first bridge. And they said that they turned around and saw the biggest sturgeon they'd ever seen. And it scared the heck out of them. But nobody to my knowledge has ever caught a sturgeon in that lake. I mean, if you go back before the days of dams, the Okanagan Lake system flows into the Okanagan River, which flows into Columbia River, which, you know, obviously enters the ocean. So is it possible? Sure, it's possible. There's there's sturgeon, there's sturgeon in the Columbia. Why wouldn't there be, you know what I mean? It, they could have come up that system years and years ago. But you hear about, I hear about that every once in a while. I, I don't have any urban urban myth or urgent. Uh, I mean, we've got what they call the Ogopogo, which is a, uh, a mythical kind of Loch Ness monster in the uh, in the Okanagan Lake. You don't want to know what I think about that. <laughs> it depends on how much Merlot you've had. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And then you start seeing one. Are there any well, famous... I was going to say you get lots of weird wave action there. Um, there are some really big fish in that lake. It's a long, deep lake. But um, just the way the wind hits it, you get all these kind of weird waves that'll pop up from... You know, you see some interesting wave patterns out there, and you could take some pretty cool pics. But uh, it's a beautiful lake full of beaches, some some large rainbow trout, which are, which are kind of hard to catch, but they're there. Are there any famous hatches up in your area? You know what we do get, which we have some amazing, amazing mayfly hatches. There's like a, a sulfur hatch on, on the Similkameen that I find fascinating, and a stonefly hatch. We get these big California stoneflies. And they're giant, and and when they're going, if you time it right, I mean it's it's uh, it's wild. I've only ever hit it twice, and I fish that river every year that I can remember, and I've only hit it twice. You see the casings, you see them in the water, you see the nymphs, but when they're hatching, if you ever hit that, it's like it's um, it, it's like a gong show, and there's I don't know where the fish come from, but they show up. Shows you just what's down there that we never actually see. Mm. We also get a on on Okanagan Lake, and I, I remember this even as a kid. You know, you go to the beach, and all of a sudden you get these. Um, I don't even know the proper name for them, but they're a giant mayfly. I think they're called Hexa. Texagenia. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. They are giant. Yeah, they like, use snow plows in the Midwest to clear them off bridges. 
We'll, we'll, we'll go to the, you'll go and gas up at the gas station. They'll be all over the pump if it's down near the lake. And they are giant. I'll, I'll never forget. And that, and that, you see that every year. It's kind of, um, that's a later thing. I want to say July. They're, they're big. And the fish, the fish are like those. But that's, I mean, it's pretty hard to fly fish effectively large, large bodies of water unless you're pulling, you know, uh, bucktail patterns or, uh, you know, minnow patterns. Are there any famous Canadian tires in your area or in general that someone down here may not be familiar with? <laughs> Did you say Canadian tires? Tires. Not like the store Canadian tire. I was going to say, I actually used to manage, I uh, was the sporting goods manager at Canadian Tire. We went to here. the one in Montreal just so I could actually see what it's all about. You can get well, everything it's like, there. You can't, well, I'll tell you what, I spent a lot of time in there because I'm into gardening. So I got the gardening stuff. You got, you got anything for your vehicle. You got anything for the outdoors? Anything for the house? It's yeah. It's no. It's a uh, it's a great shop for sure. I forgot your question. Canadian famous fly tires. Oh, tires! Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you say Canadian tire, I was not thinking of fly tying. I got to tell you. Thought about that, but I don't there, hear the word Canadian what? tire very often. There's with reference to the <laughs> store. There's there's a lot of tires. And you're asking the wrong guy because I'm not, I follow a lot of tires, but, um, you know, the same names always keep coming up on the podcast and I, I watch a lot of those guys, but, um, I, 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 I couldn't name a lot of famous Canadian flight tires. Ken, Phil Rowley, he ties some, some mean patterns. Brian Chan, I mean, he's, uh, he's as well known a, a fly fisher as you'll, as you'll get anywhere. And he's a, a Stillwater legend in, in British Columbia and beyond and uh, his patterns are are amazing what about authors and writers are there any specific people that you would pick a book up of mm-hmm. you'd have well, no idea about them down here roderick haig brown he still never read his stuff yeah it's amazing very um very inspirational and 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 more of a right like obviously passionate about the outdoors and uh, it's a lot of Vancouver Island kind of uh, steelhead and um, salmon rivers, but very inspirational stuff. Uh, Brian Chan has 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 some great books, but I would say Roderick Haig Brown would would be one. Would there be fly fishing pioneers that would not be in the fly tie or <laughs> or author category? Personalities <laughs> like famous teachers, someone like. Like Joe Humphreys down here, or George Daniel. I mean, we're so influenced by by you guys that it's 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 the same names, right? I mean, it really is. I'm at a bit of a loss for that, and I'm, I so got to tell you, I, I I should know more than I do about that. But it's um, the history of it that's not kind of my my wheelhouse. So you send all your funny people here, and then we send all of our fly fishing information north. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, Except well, I mean, just, I always... someone assaulted Rick Moranis recently. Really? Yeah, he got sucker punched in New York City. Hmm. I you talk about famous, I mean, fly tire. I always think of Lee Wolf. Um, I think of uh, who do I think of? Um, Jack Dennis. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it comes down to. I'm. If you went to, say, Atlantic Canada and you asked the same question, you'd have some really well-known tires of, um, you know, Atlantic salmon flies that I'm, I'm not familiar with. So um, it's a big question. But um, from where I'm at, it's, it's the Brian Chans, the Phil Rollies. Um, those would be a couple right there. All right. What is it like to catch a wild steelhead that was not born in a test tube? <laughs> well I, you gotta ask somebody like Lonnie Waller that who we had on the show like I you're, you're talking to a guy that fished the Thompson River and really all I ever caught in there was salmon I never actually did hook a steelhead and I have I've probably only gone true steelhead fly fishing a handful of times I mean we were back in the day we were more about the floats and the yarn and, and that type of, of, of fishing for steelhead and uh you're asking the wrong guy because that's not my wheelhouse, but I can only like, imagine. Go ahead, sir. What's it like catching a wild salmon that wasn't born in a test tube? Because I've only caught 
test tube I, salmon I, and test tube steelies. I do think there's a difference there. I can't speak to that because I've caught a lot of salmon river systems in, in say, the lower mainland area, whether it's the Chehalis or the Vetter or basically – I think I think wild fish fight better. I think you know what would be a comparison in my mind is like when you're fishing a lot of these stock lakes, um, and you're catching say Fraser Valleys, and they just kind of tug, 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 tug. But when you get like a wild panask or a wild any like a wild blackwater, say in the Blackwater River, those things they've never been hooked before for the most part, and they're going to get aerial. But when you when you're I think when you're fishing a lot of highly pressured systems. Especially, just to put it to you this way, Rob, I fish quite a few catch and release lakes. And that, to be honest, is where a lot of the big fish are because they keep getting put back. But what happens is, in my opinion, they, a lot of them have been caught f- before. So it's like, oh, oh, this. I remember this. It hurts. My, you know, it hurts for a while and then, and then they'll let me go. And they, they're not going to fight like a fish that's never been hooked. I, I think wild fish usually get more aerial. And I think um, they usually fight harder. What's going on like, back there? I'm curious. Have you got like, is that an aquarium I'm hearing? You can hear that? I can hear that aquarium, yeah. What kind of fish you got in there? Stupid goldfish. I usually unplug it. I just unplugged it now, so. No, I like it. I, I felt like I was at the river. Oh, I'll turn it back on. We have Spotty, the large goldfish, and Dottie, the smaller goldfish, and then George, the crayfish you actually so, name your fish yeah i specifically got the white one with a small orange dot so my daughter could call it dotty <laughs> and you feed the crayfish frozen peas one of the peas was floating today and spotty went up and ate it whole off the surface mm. yeah i don't Still care much for anything in there i want them all to die Come on, you don't mean that. I got, I got, I think most fisher, fly fishers or fisher people that fish have, have fish. I bet, um, <laughs> you'll laugh. I've, I raised koi. So I've got, um, I, I used to have, uh, like a little waterfall in this, this pond that I built. And then I had the raccoons just come every year and devastate them. So I finally got smart and I, I have this greenhouse. So I dug out the bottom of the greenhouse about four and a half feet down. So it doesn't really freeze, even in the coldest winter. They pretty much grow year round. So they um, got five of them in there, but you want these they're two? getting pretty. They're getting pretty big. Uh, no, I'm good. I got uh, I got all the so guppies and. Uh, my wife there. can't. She can't be home with us during the day, so she rents a room at uh, our neighbor's house, Fred, and he gave us three dozen guppies. And by morning, they were gone. The goldfish ate them all. Really. And the crayfish sure. ate his wife, Martha. Uh, he's eaten a couple of guppies. He eats all the snails. So we can't have anything in there. It's just like sterile. Mm. There's just the crayfish cuts every plant to pieces. I ripped <laughs> off one of his front claws. It hasn't grown back yet just to kind of prevent it from destroying everything. Oh. And no, the I have not had crayfish. I have had snails. Never get and them. they took over my tank. See, I can't. We don't have time for that. And the goldfish just pick up the gravel all day, suck it, and then spit it out, try to get the algae. Mm-hmm. So you just hear this like gravelly sound. All I hate them. But do you not find it relaxing? Like I absolutely love having fish in the house. Like it's just for me, I find it really relaxing. Before the crayfish, we had wild scuds, <laughs> uh, a couple crest bugs, uh, some leeches, wild. Like it was a wild aquarium, stuff locally, snails having scuds in your aquarium is awesome they're so entertaining but these things yeah. eat everything we need to just cook them have a fish and crayfish fry it's pretty cool when you can look at like you just talked about uh like scuds like you when you can actually see up close how they act i think that really helps your fishing those legs just move non-stop but they are so fast in the water mayflies too uh mayflies stoneflies how just slow they move in the tank but if you pick them up, how fast they swim. I mean, honestly, oh, yeah. if you want to mimic a mayfly, just a three quarter inch piece of olive marabou on a hook moving through the water looks exactly the same. But we tie yep. flashback, soft tackle, pheasant tails. 
It's funny you said that. That's uh, a pattern that we use for mayflies is we use, uh, it's a ginger marabou, like a tan color, and just a small little bead at the front. But basically all you're looking at is a tiny hook with marabou that kind of moves back and forth naturally in the water with a bead head, and it's deadly. should try it on these two and hook them and get rid of them. (laughs) So when you're going to go do a day of still water fishing, what are you mm-hmm. packing? What's your gear? You mentioned belly boats earlier. What's your what's your hardware? Yeah. How do you dress? Okay. So I kind of we graduate. I mean, belly boats. I'm going back 30 years. We were fishing on the belly boats, and then and then the pontoon boats came along. And I've got a Dave Scadden. Um, I've, got, I've got a Scadden in the garage, but I've been using the Watermaster more. Yeah, I, well, I had a Watermaster too. Or sorry, water skeeter. I had a water skeeter. A pontoon boat which i like i've also got like an aluminum 14 and a half foot wide bow boat that we use on slightly bigger water i so i'm funny when it comes to fly rods i'm not overly fussy i will tell you that for the waters that we're on a 10 foot five weight is kind of the the meal ticket uh longer rods are better because we're throwing a lot of times indicators for chronomid like with chronomid patterns or midge patterns trying to um kind of get in that you know 12 to 15 foot zone underneath a a strike indicator i have a an orvis helios 3 which i love Uh, i have a echo both of those are 10 foot five weights i have a reddington i have a what else have i got i've got a hardy yeah you know it's like anything i the Helios is my go-to rod if I had to pick one. Um, it's a lot of money, though. I mean, I, I spent more than I should have probably on that. But, like, just so you know, I don't I don't get anything for free. For me, it's all trial and error. I like, I, li- I like the price point of the Echoes. I like the price point of the Reddingtons. I like the price point of the Douglas rods. Um, that's a company that I'm, I'm looking at right now. But, you know, that two to three hundred dollar range with a lifetime warranty is is appealing to me because i do break them and for whatever reason i have this really bad habit of never wanting to return anything so i'm like a dream for rod companies i got um a lot of four piece rods that are now six pieces and they're old they're just sitting there i just never sent them off and i my buddy gives me a hard time all the time i i probably should at least sell it to someone or give it to somebody else but this year, I think I had more broken five weights than most people owned five weights. Just what is it with that? Like, why? So why don't you send them back? I don't even know why I don't send them back. I just can't. I be think it's we weren't leaving the house. <laughs> I don't know. The one broke yeah. like two years ago. My neighbor was supposed to fix it, and she never got around to it. Hmm. I, I just ordered a bunch of like random tips off eBay and just fitted a whole bunch of rods and found the ones they fit on and just epoxied them on. Well, do you know what I've found lately is that I love the, the fly line itself is really important to me. And, and, and you can spend a lot of money on fly lines now. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll kind of skimp out on the reel. Like I don't have to, I don't have to have the latest, greatest reel, but the rod and the line for me is, is, is most important. Are you doing overhand casting or roll casting when you're in that low down boat? Because that would make your line rather important. A hundred percent overhead. Like I, I just uh, ten o'clock, two o'clock all day. That's why I like the Helios too, because it is super light and getting that little extra leverage. We get some pretty good wind gusts around here too, so there's a lot of there's a lot of kite surfing and wind 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 surfers in in some of the waters that we're near, and it's like. Um, if you're out early in the morning or later in the day, you can sometimes kind of um, miss those those wind gusts. But I always call it the two o'clock wind. At two o'clock, it's always windy, and that's when you really want a longer rod. Like you don't want to be trying to throw an eight and a half foot rod in in a in a big still water system. It'd be like fishing Pyramid Lake, right? Like um, I mean, I've never fished it, but I I know that I probably wouldn't be going there with an eight foot rod. I think Pyramid's opening up soon. Yeah. It's been closed for seven or eight months because of COVID. Mm. Right. Now, the coronamid fly, Mm -hmm. there are a thousand different coronamid flies. Is it just because you can get super creative with them? No, it's... Change the the ribbing, the 
puff on the tip for the gills? Well, for me, it's how they, and, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm not making this stuff up. It's what, it's what the experts say. And I've, I've actually witnessed is, is the chronomid changes in the water column. So any nymph, any insect that's emerging, usually in deeper water, they're darker colors. And as they come up, they, then you start seeing those chromies and kind of those, um, um, uh, bright silver kind of uh, once they trap that gas in their pupa and they're trying to emerge they start rising and to us it looks very silver it's very shiny so I think you know like a rainbow warrior type of look so for me if there's any red in there there's just a lot of hemoglobin that's usually present and as those chronomids or those uh, pupa emerge they do change color, right? It depends from where they're where the trout are taking them. If they're taking them on the surface, they're going to look more like the, the adult. But if they're taking them as, you know, in, in fairly clear water, usually in maybe say between, you know, ten and five feet, they're usually they can be quite chrome, quite silver in color. So, uh, black and silver is a real big one for us. Red and silver, because again, you're showing that hemoglobin that's uh, present in in blood worms and in 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 the pupa. Black is a go-to for, for me, like black with a silver rib, maybe a red butt. If you put a little bit of red, and you know, um, Pete uh, Stitcher verbalized this really well. He said, if you put like a little hot spot on any of your flies, he said, think about, think about a lion in the, you know, in, in Africa, that's, that's, it's on a herd of gazelles, and gazelles are on the menu. And it's looking at these gazelles, and one of them's bleeding, or one of them has a little hot spot. Guess what? That's where the attention's going to go. That's that's the way nature is. They look for the weak, and they'll try to take that out. So why that not little... just tie the whole thing out of the hot spot? Like the joke, why not make the airplane out of the black box? <laughs> but you know why? Because then it doesn't stand out. What right? if the what if you reversed it so the the natural color was the hot spot, and the whole the, thing? Now was... you, you're talking like a fly tower. I, that's how right. I. You, yeah, like how we just, see yeah. a flower versus how a bumblebee sees a flower. Well, and that's why there's there's so many different chronomid patterns, right? But I don't think I get into this big thing on on my show about uh, realistic versus suggestive patterns, and I think sometimes as tires we get too caught up in the realistic. Like you just said it yourself, you take a piece of marabou and you tie it on a hook, you've got a killer fly pattern, but. The reality is someone will spend five hours trying to make it look exactly like that specific mayfly pattern, which then maybe it doesn't have the movement in the water. So, you know, if you can talk in, and that's why searching patterns are so effective, right? Because they're generalities. You know, if you've got the general color and the general size and the general movement, and it's in a within a bunch of other, you know, emerging chronomids or mayflies or damselflies, chances are that fish will probably have a go at it. And when we tie our flies, we're using them under bright lights, looking up close at them, how they're never going to look in the natural. We should be mm. wearing goggles full of dirty water when we tie our flies to see how oh, the yeah. fish see it. Well, and when you get them, when you actually put them in the water, they change color too. And it's, um, that's why I think there's, that's why I love fly tying because you can get as creative as you want to get. I'll, I'll tie patterns that never even see the water or I'll tie a, a lot of one-offs and it's like, oh man, this is working, but I just lost it. And I can't remember for the life of me exactly how I tied that. I'm really bad for that, but that's part of the puzzle for me. It's like, you know what? I can remember one day we were, we were fishing this lake, very aqua blue lake up in the uh, Salmon Arm area, which is uh, about a two and a half hour drive from where I'm at. We followed chronomids as they were popping, and we were doing throat samples. So they started on this bright green, like fluorescent, almost chartreuse green uh, limes, we, we used to call them. But um, that was the, the pattern that they were taking. And when we throat sampled the fish, that's what they were feeding on. And then they t went for this carrot, kind of orange-colored chronomid with a, with, a, with a silver rib, and it had a black kind of... Um, like a double rib, like a black and a silver double rib on it. And then that was lights out. And, and as you followed through the day, you change your pattern. And I've experienced days like that where like just those little tiny changes make all the difference. 
And I know it sounds some days, you know, it's just black and red, black and red. It's it's the old standby, but don't be afraid to change it up. And those throat samples, if you do it properly, are I think are are safe for the fish if you know what you're doing. And you talk about um, the stomach pump. Yeah, like just a, we call it a throat because you don't really put it in the stomach. You just put it in their throat. And if you're doing it properly, it's like a tiny turkey baster. I mean, I wouldn't be doing that on on fish on hot summer days in river systems, but um, still waters, uh, cold water. If you treat them right, you can you can find out what they're feeding on, and that's that's something that you know Chan and and Rolly have have have. have I've learned from just whether it's online or just uh, videos and whatnot. And it's, it's really helped. I mean, when you can see what those fish are feeding on, it's one thing to see them eat it. It's another thing to see what they're actually feeding on and have a sample. It's like some fish will just barf up. I've had striped bass barf up baby bluegill. I'm like, well, I know what I'm tying up tonight. <laughs> yeah. I've well, got a and- picture of this little itty bitty one inch bluegill in my palm that was thrown up. And I was like, that's what I need to match. I keep going back to this Pete Stitcher interview, but he, he, he said, look at the spider webs. So when you're on the side of the river, you're getting in your boat or whatever, look at what is fresh in that web. Cause that's, what's coming off the water. I thought that was a good tip. Yep. Yeah. Always on the bridges too. Mm. That's right. I had really another cool. guy say, look, look what's on the front of your car. Or your Not truck. anymore. There's no more bugs out. I mean, I was telling Art recently that I drove three road trips this summer and barely had to clean my windshield once. We just don't have the bugs like we used to in the summer. There's no hopper stuck to the grill. Yeah. Well, yeah, up here there is. Um, I mean, I honestly, my grill gets covered, especially in, you know, in the summer, right? I mean, you're talking July and August. Lots of butterflies anymore. Really? There are no more butterflies. To see a monarch is super weird. Maybe one see, I don't, Where I'm at, we don't get monarchs. So, and I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody told me that basically west of the Rockies, you don't see a lot of them. Oh, there's a whole big book written about them migrating from Canada through, I want to say California or Seattle. Okay. Purple book. And it's a I'll monarch? I've yeah. never seen a butterfly. We have ones called painted ladies, and we have uh, viceroys, and we have um, morning cloaks, tiger swallowtails. We have all kinds of butterflies, but I have actually never seen a. Um, a mon- I'm not saying they don't happen, but I've never seen one here. Now, when you are doing some stillwater fishing, you mentioned there aren't a whole lot of rounds. What else might you catch, and what would you consider like a trashy bycatch that you didn't want to catch? A sucker. Uh, and honestly, I've, I've, I haven't caught a lot of those over the years, but they're a natural bottom feeder in some of the river systems. I actually, a lot of people feel that way when they catch carp, but I, I, I enjoy carp. I think they're a lot of fun. Cannot find good carp fishing around me. Nor, Northern pike minnow. That would be the one that, that people are like, oh, just, you know. they're uh, Basically, they're not a game fish, although they, they fight pretty well for, for the first time few seconds but then they give it up and they, they tend to feed pretty voraciously on other fish so you know they're hard on kokanee populations they're hard on salmon fry they're hard on in, any any minnows so that would be one that i uh, i would leave all right anything canada that i forgot to ask canada fishing <laughs> well it's just it's such a diverse you're talking about a very large area. So, I mean, what we fish for here, most of Canada, like the further north you go, you're not going to see largemouth bass, right? You'll see smallmouth bass because they can handle the cooler water. And you'll see, like where I'm at, there's no pike. There's no muskie. Those are a cooler water fish. So further south you go, you're going to see more more bass, more perch. Further north you go, you're going to see more grayling. Um, you can get into Arctic char, which I've had some some folks on the show talk about some of the Arctic char fishing in northern Canada, which sounds amazing. Uh, brook trout, which love cold water. You know, grayling, which I mentioned, which I, that's on my list. I mean, there's no grayling where I'm at. It's too warm. But it's it's no different than than you know the the difference between fishing Alaska and fishing Florida. I mean, it's, it's pretty darn different, right? So when you go down to you know say southern Vancouver Island, uh, there's people out there that are are catching all types of salmon, but they're catching mackerel and they might be catching tuna. 
and then you go, you know, to the East Coast, and there's, you know, it's no different than Massachusetts or, or parts of New York where, you know, it's all about the striper fishing. You know, it's the coasts echo the coast. No, it doesn't really matter where you're at. But the further north you get, you're going to find some some species of fish. Yeah, a lot more white fish, like mountain white fish, grayling, pike, uh, walleye, or uh, you know, um, that's that's a, a fish that I don't really see a lot around here. Again, it likes cooler water, but apparently, uh, great great uh, table fish for sure. That's what they tell me. Mm-hmm. Pickerel, right. the other one. Some guys call them pickerel. You ready for some nonsensical, miscellaneous, random questions? I love, I love nonsensical stuff. Excellent. We're all about all right. that. Uh, when was the last time you personally came down with the case of the meat sweats? <laughs> I got to tell you exactly when it was. I was at Canadian a wine Thanksgiving. store. No, 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 no. This was a bad case too. I ordered the biggest steak. I was on the road, so it's not every day I get to have steak. Um, although we do do a lot of barbecuing, but I was on the road at a wine show in Vancouver and I'm trying to remember the name of the steakhouse. It was a real high end steakhouse in, in a newer hotel. There's a casino there. I can visualize it at the park. I think it's called the park. I forget the name of the restaurant, but anyway, I ordered this giant steak, which I had no business eating, you know, plenty of uh, Cabernet to go along with it. But <laughs> you know, when you're, you see it on your plate and you go, yeah, I, I got to finish this off because it's so good. And then at some point it's like, I don't know what I was thinking. I overdid but, it. Oh yeah. It's, it, and it's, Can't it's move. almost, it's like you get like a meat hangover. It's like, it's like a, a two day. Okay. I think I'm going to eat uh, cereal and water for a while. It takes a lot of energy to break all that stuff down. <laughs> I do. And that's honestly, I don't eat a lot of fish. I do. I do have a soft spot for for anything uh, ribeye related, but um, it's not. It's not always that healthy, is it? No. All right. If you only had one bird species to tie with for the rest of your life, what bird would it be? Hmm. That's a great question. I, I want to say pheasant, but I got. Where does marabou come from? I guess chickens. It's got to be a turkey. chicken. No, I've got some rumps here. There's some, there's some marabouy kind of plumes on, on a pheasant tail. I mean, I could, I could, I could live without pheasant tail, but I couldn't live without marabou. Just tails on leeches. Um, I just love how it moves in the water. So do you have a favorite, favorite leech pattern to use up there. I do. We Land call it probably. Um, we call it no. We call it the black and blue. And it's a balanced leech, actually. So it's it's basically a, a balanced um, black leech with a little bit of um, iridescent blue throughout it and combed with a Velcro comb so that it looks all sparse. And that that imitates, well, that could be a leech. It could be a dragon. It could be a, it could be a case caddis, you know, if you do it right. It, it, it could even be a bait fish, and it works. And that, that black and blue... Even a little purple in there sometimes, but we just call it, uh, me and my buddy Steve, we call it the black and blue. All right. He calls it a Chicago. I don't, I'm not sure why he calls it a Chicago, but I call it a black and blue. Deep dish. Or it's windy. <laughs> uh, if you could have a superhero's power to make you a better angler, which power would you choose? Mm. X-ray vision. So you could see under the water where the fish are at. What is the worst place you've ever fished? The worst place I ever fished was a tailings pond off of the Fraser River. It was full of chum salmon, and it was it was kind of sewery and kind of like um, muddy, and uh, that I I wouldn't go there again. Who's got the best sandwich off of Highway ninety seven? Wow. That's a great question. I'd have to say, I'd have to say probably the Terrafina restaurant at, at the winery. Uh, Oliver Eats has a, uh, has an amazing food truck there too. And, and their sandwiches are, are pretty, pretty, pretty standout. What was your favorite day of fly fishing? You can close your eyes and just, that was, that was the hmm. cat's pajamas. 
That's a tough one to pick one, but I'm going to tell you, it was under a full moon on a local lake, on a catch and release lake. It was like a Valentine's um, Day. <laughs> no, no. Um, it was a hundred degree day, but at night it cooled off to, you know, like say the high seventies. So your t-shirts under a full moon, the lake is lit up. We're fishing two and a half inch long gomphus darner dragonfly patterns and just um, getting spooled just that all the time in the dark. You don't know what's coming up. You can barely see the fish. Uh, that's I'll never forget those nights. And we, we do it every year, but I have yet to um, duplicate the success that we had when we first started doing it because uh, there's something pretty cool about fishing in the dark and there's something the big guys come out when there's no ospreys or bald eagles around and, and uh, fishing in the dark is uh, is pretty cool. What is your home fly shop? Well, <laughs> funny story. Actually, where I'm at, there's not really a fly shop. There's a hunting shop that sells some flies, but it's not really a fly shop. Uh, best fly shop locally uh, is in Kelowna, and it's called Trout Waters, and uh, it's it's a great shop. They're, they've got everything in there. Uh, Nick and Savas. I, well, most of the stuff on my wall is from that shop. I mean, you know, I do buy some stuff online, but um, I, I'm old school in that I just, I love going into a shop and, and seeing the patterns and seeing the materials. Um, I haven't fully embraced the online thing yet, but um, there's something special about going into a fly shop. And I think also growing up working in one, it kind of it's just a comfortable place for me and I could spend way too long and way too much money in, in any fly shop. While you are on highway 97, what's your most played album? Oh, geez. I got to say Eric church. Um, desperate man. Is that the name of the last one? His last album. I'm bad with remembering album titles, but, um, I'm a huge Eric church. I mean, I, I love country, right? So I worked in country radio for a lot of years. So I have a lot of, uh, I love Kenny Chesney. I love anything that's kind of, uh, I like, I like the bluesiness kind of originality that church has. I, I just think he's, uh, he's doing something that I don't hear anybody else doing. And, uh, it's real. And I, I just, I can't even define it. I mean, I'm growing up, I was a hard rock guy. Um, but I, I love country. It speaks to me now. And it's like anything. I think it, different phases you're at in life music talks to you in different ways but my, my taste in music is i mean i listen to metallica i'll listen to taylor swift i'll listen to uh, you know uh, you name it I'll, my kids are into a lot of rap and then i'll find the odd song that i like but um i'm a country guy do you have any superstitions in general any fishing superstitions routines rituals you have to do before a trip do not put diesel in your truck before you go fishing and is i will not have a truck? banana i will not have take... a banana what is it a diesel truck i had a diesel uh three-quarter ton and um one time i uh fueling up i got diesel on my hands and i swear i never got a bite that day and it was lights out fishing and i i i can never prove it but i think fuel in general try not to get it on your hands because uh, you get that on your lot not pretty. I, and, I just want to make sure it wasn't a car that took regular gas. That was my no, concern. I, I, I've done that. I've done that. I, my, <laughs> I realized that you know, this, is, this is a funny story, but it was an expensive story. I had a, the same truck. It was a Ram three-quarter ton diesel and old Cummings. And I had uh, <laughs> I was in a hurry one day. It was, I was Christmas. It was, it was near Christmas. I was Christmas shopping. It was snowing. I was just trying to get home. And I pulled up. I started filling it up. And I went, oh, crap. I was putting regular fuel into my diesel. And so I phoned, I phoned my buddy who's a mechanic. He's like, do not start it. If you start it, it's going to be way more money. Just don't start it. Get it towed. So I got it towed to the dealership. And um, I, I guess it, I'm not a mechanic in any way, shape, or form, but I think uh, if you don't get it into the fuel pump, I think it saves you some money. But they somehow got it out, and crisis averted. 
But I will not. I will not eat bananas when I'm fishing. That's, That's my horrible. superstition. Yeah, I was uh, watching a guy get a uh, ticket for not having his life jacket on on the Potomac once, and then you hear with the loudspeaker, "Is that a banana in your boat?" She's like, "What in God's name are you doing with a banana in your fishing boat?" <laughs> And, and everyone just kind of stopped and watched her berate this guy for having a banana. It's pretty funny. <laughs> two, two other things that I'm really careful with, Rob, is um, sunscreen spray and uh, mosquito bug spray. Like, I, I don't want that anywhere near my fly box. And with COVID, I'm just completely covered up. I don't think I wore sunscreen once this year. I put it on my cheeks the other day mm. for driving to the river, but I don't think I put on sunscreen once. When I was fishing this year, gloves, hat, face mask, my yeah, your capris. <laughs> yeah, no. I, if I, I when it gets super hot, and especially when some of the higher elevation lakes, you uh, that sun it it cuts pretty hard. <laughs> you need you need sunscreen, a really good hat, and uh, usually something around your neck. Yeah. All right, let's round this off with a story that had to been there to believe. <laughs> I got a few, but um, I got to say the one that always sticks with me, we were on this lake. We were in the Kamloops area. I could name the lake, but it's kind of small, so I, I, I'm not going to. But um, there's some nice fish in this lake, and it's a nasty road getting in there. And we got in there, and there was mosquitoes the size of pie plates everywhere. It was just it was a gong show just getting in. But once you got on the water, you calmed down. My buddy gets into this fish, and it's it's a nice, say, pound and a half, maybe two pounds max uh, rainbow. It's jumping out of the water, and he's all excited because we didn't really know that there were fish in this lake, to be quite honest. We heard there was. So we're on this lake. It's a small lake, and all of a sudden, his line just goes... <laughs> And I look over at him. He's like, it's huge. It's huge. And I'm thinking, no, it's not huge because I just saw it jump and it might be a pound and a half. And the next thing you see, this loon surface with his fish. Oh, no. right? So he's pulling on he's pulling on the on the line and the poor loon, his head's going forward. It's like a little tug of war. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, this is going to be good. Then from out of nowhere, this osprey dives on the loon and it's trying to take the fish from the loon and um, we were laughing so hard because my buddy he he didn't know what to do he's trying to get the line out of the uh, he's trying to get the hook back out of the fish so the loon can have the fish and then the osprey's bomb it was just like a i wish i had a camera then it was like kind of before cell phones were you know well they didn't have cameras you know what i mean you had your cell phone but you couldn't be taking any pictures with it and uh I just never forget it. We were laughing so hard at this, and, and eventually, the uh, the loon won out. The osprey gave up, and uh, he lost the fish. And he got he got a nice straight hook back as a reward. But I'll never forget that. It was just like I had you had to see it to believe it. That's pretty crazy. Ugh. Where can listeners of my podcast that haven't listened to your podcast yet find you? to listen and your social media and anything else yeah well thanks for asking I, I appreciate it and thanks for having me on it's been a blast um just fly fishing 97 podcast so basically on instagram fly fishing 97 podcast you can link to the show through the bio i mean like you it's it's everywhere it's on uh it's on i'm through soundcloud but you can find it on itunes spotify stitcher google podcasts you'll find it anywhere you find uh your favorite podcasts all right. Mr. Mark, thank you for joining us tonight. Rob, it's, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it, and, and we'll have to catch up again in the in the near future. Right on, dude. I'll drive out there, or we'll meet halfway, like in uh, Wyoming. Bring the meat sweats. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast.
podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.